Welcome fellow travelers of the Forgotten Roads and wanderers of wilds to the Verdant Enclave. I'm your host, and sometimes friendly DM. More relevant to today's discussion, I'm also your fellow wanderer and wilderness guide to the Ranger class of 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. If you're new to the channel, welcome! If you're returning from the last videos, thank you for continuing on this journey into the Ranger class with me. Last time, we discussed the level 2 features, fighting style and spell casting, where the Ranger adds to their toolkit combat and out of combat tools. Of particular note is that Hunter's Mark is described as the Ranger's best and only means of making comparable damage to other combat classes. We'll come back to that later. If you want to hear details of the other videos, feel free to check it out. But now we move on to another level. Primeval Awareness. The infamous primeval awareness gets much misaligned, and not entirely without reason. After all, the focus tends to fall heavily on its inability to reveal a creature's location, specific kind, or the number of creatures you've detected. Yes, that's very unfortunate. So instead, use it in conjunction with your character's ability to interact with the world. Let's break it down. You use your action and expend one ranger spell slot to focus your awareness on the region around you. For one minute per level of the spell slot you expend, you can sense whether the following types of creatures are present within one mile of you, or within up to six miles if you are in your favored terrain. This includes aberrations, celestials, dragons, elementals, fey, fiends, and undead. This feature, like I said, does not reveal the creature's location or number. Bear in mind that rangers are half-casters. They don't get a lot of spell slots, so they do need to be careful how and when they use them. But on the other hand, they don't need to rely on their spells like other casters do. So utilizing their spell slots to help their companions is comparatively more useful. As mentioned in earlier videos, there are 14 types of creatures in the world of Dungeons & Dragons. Primeval Awareness allows you to detect the presence of literally half of those types. And bear in mind that most of those you can detect are the ones that are very dangerous to be surprised by. For example, you and your companions are approaching a ruined village in the depths of the Darkling Woods. Cold mist clings wetly to the buildings, and half-shapes in the mist suggests the menacing presence of the undead. You've fought them before, so you're confident you can hold your own, but you open your senses regardless. Sure enough, you feel the decaying presence of undead, and the ominous presence of the far greater draconic power. Quickly, you signal your allies to stealth and silence before they can rouse such a deadly foe, as the battlefield dynamics have just changed. Further, this is not a momentary awareness, but a duration ability equal to one minute per spell level, concentration free. Let's do some math on this one. While using the travel pace provided in the player's handbook, a ranger can have a one mile radius awareness for 300 feet of movement for the cost of a first level spell slot. If I guess that I am one mile and 150 feet from a destination I have not yet visited, I can now activate my primeval awareness and move toward the destination. As it comes within the bubble of my awareness, I can infer that if I detect anything, it is likely near the destination, as I hadn't detected it before, or at least it's somewhere between myself and the destination. And now I know to proceed with stealth and caution, and I have safeguarded my allies. It only costs me, the ranger, a half-caster, one spell slot, which is 
a lot better than say half or more of your party's total resources in spell slots, hit points, potions, spell scrolls, so on and so forth. So what about other detection abilities? For example, the Paladin Divine Sense, or just most divination magic in general? Well, they have two issues, range and obstruction. Both can be blocked, primarily by a few feet of stone or wood, or in the case of locate creature, simply by flowing water. Mordenkainen's private sanctum blocks divination sensors, and creatures within it cannot be targeted by divination magic. Coincidentally, that includes Hunter's Mark. The famous Arcane Eye spell, as powerful and high level as it is, can be blocked by something as simple as a shut window or door. But primeval awareness is not divination magic. Higher level and impressive spells like Mordenkainen's Private Sanctum, which block divination magic, do nothing to stop primeval awareness, nor does any depth of wood, metal, or stone. The only thing which can block primeval awareness is in fact the shape change ability, or the polymorph spell. A being must literally change its creature type. Again, the ranger is a half-caster. It is far less painful for them to use primeval awareness than it is for a wizard to use a high-level spell slot for arcane eye. If nothing else, the ranger may detect no presence of enemies, and now the wizard can decide for themselves is it worth it to cast Arcane Eye? So, is primeval awareness useless, or is it useful? Well, it is useful, but only as much as you make use of it. It is a great big radar ping that gives you information, and how you use that information is up to you and your teammates. For example, even if you detect nothing by using it, you know that 50% of the types of creatures, at least, unless they're using polymorph or shape change, are not nearby you. Again, it doesn't hurt that the creatures you can detect are precisely the kind that enjoy sneaking up on you. Rangers also gain their subclass option at third level. Let's start with the Hunter. The Hunter is the premier combat-oriented subclass of the Ranger, focusing on adding damage or attack opportunities. A lot of people have criticized the options at this level as being too circumstantial, or not stacking as your character goes up in level, or not feeling like what the name is. Of the complaints I've heard, the circumstantial nature of these features is the most relevant, but the circumstances are actually fairly common to encounter. Let's take a look. Colossus Slayer most often gets compared to Sneak Attack. Both features require you to hit the target, add extra damage on top of what you're doing, and occur once per turn, though Sneak Attack does grow with Rogue level. Sneak Attack, however, requires you to use a finesse or ranged weapon, have advantage on the attack, or have another enemy of your target within five feet of your target without being incapacitated, and for you to not have disadvantage on your attack. Further, rogues have only one attack per turn. They can use two weapon fighting to increase their chances of doing sneak attack on their turn, but they then potentially cost their bonus action alternatives, which tend to help rogues survive, an important consideration with their lower armor class and fewer hit points. They could multi-class for extra attack, but they slow down their rogue class progression. Colossus Slayer requires you to hit a wounded target. Yeah, that's it. No specific weapons, no specific conditions beyond a wounded target. 
Since the ranger has extra attack after level 5, you can eff effectively give this to yourself. Coincidentally, it is a once per turn ability, so like sneak attack, it can be applied out of turn on something like an attack of opportunity. Colossus Slayer is the easiest to understand and utilize of the Hunter's abilities. But then there is Giant Killer, which requires multiple components to be in place before you can use it. One, you must be able to see. Two, you must be within five feet of a large or larger creature. And three, use your reaction. So this is a once per round ability. If those conditions are met, then once per round, when a large or larger creature attacks you, hit or miss, you can use your reaction immediately to attack them back. Clearly, this is risky on multiple levels for the ranger, which, in general, prefers to be at ranged combat. So let's examine this. Recall from my last video that you have fighting styles. Choose defense and focus on increasing your armor class as much as possible, as well as your hit points, and you can become a fairly formidable tank. Add to that the addition of a reaction attack, and against the right-sized creature, you could get out a fair number of attacks. But keep in mind that this does not require you to be using a melee weapon. You could be fighting with a ranged weapon. Now, this would mean that you're attacking at disadvantage unless you cast Fog Cloud so that your larger enemy is inside it and you are below it, which means they have disadvantage on attacking you, while you attack as normal with your bow. The only feature I can think of similar to this ability is the vaunted Battlemaster Maneuver Repost. But that requires you to be using a melee weapon, expends a resource, and requires specifically that your enemy misses you with a melee weapon for you to use it. The giant killer is usable as long as you can see and are within five feet of a larger, excuse me, a large or larger enemy who attacks you. Oh, and it does not use any resources. Horde Breaker is perhaps my favorite of the three options, however. Again, like the other two options, this ability has no weapon requirements, so it can be combined with two weapon fighting, dueling, or archery or defense. Let's dig in. Assuming that the ranger is using a bow, at third level they will be able to get off two shots instead of one. If two enemies are within five feet of each other, in range of your bow, anywhere from 150 feet to 600 feet with disadvantage. At level 5, you can now make 3 attacks with your single weapon, or 4 attacks with 2 weapon fighting, on your turn. The only other classes that can do this are the monk, who after level 5 can make 3 attacks with martial arts, or 4 attacks with the cost of 1 key point and the fighter, if they're fighting with two weapons, and an additional two more attacks once per short rest if they spend their action surge. Note that they both require the use of resources. The ranger spends no resources to use Horde Breaker, yeah, unless they're using archery. If the ranger is instead using two weapon fighting, they can make as many as four attacks on a turn, if there are enough enemies around them. A fighter has to wait till 11th level before they can make as many attacks with two weapon fighting as the ranger has been doing since 5th level. A ranger could take this with the dueling style, equip a shield, have as many attacks per turn as a two weapon wielder, and the benefits of a shield. If feats are allowed, pick up the shield master feat, and you can weaponize your bonus action as well while still having three attacks on your turn, again assuming that there are multiple enemies around you. And let's be honest, how rare is it that a party is not 
facing multiple enemies in, a, in an encounter. But this is, as stated in the previous video, one of the strengths and weaknesses of the Ranger class. Simply how customizable it is, and how easy it is to fail by making choices that don't complement others. Speaking of... The Much Maligned Beastmaster. I'm aware of the constant derision for this subclass, the disappointments, and somewhat of the variety of custom house rules to try and address the mechanics and weaknesses of this class. The biggest complaint I've heard is that the ranger has to use their action every turn to tell the beast what to do. Or do they? Examine the following from the player's handbook. The beast obeys your commands as best as it can. It takes its turn on your initiative. On your turn, you can verbally command the beast where to move, no action required. You can use your action to verbally command it to take the attack, dash, disengage, or help action. If you don't issue a command, the beast takes the dodge action. Once you have the extra attack feature, you can make one weapon attack yourself when you command the beast to take the attack action. I have scoured this text again and again, and nowhere have I seen anything supporting the every round notion. Therefore, that is an interpretation of the text. So let's take the Beastmaster and the, bet and the pet out of combat and extrapolate this interpretation to see how it holds up. Let's say the Ranger and Beast Companion are running from pursuers, or trying to escape a rolling boulder, a la Indiana Jones. Thank you, Indy. So they have to dash. Following the common interpretation of this subclass, the Ranger would have to alternate their actions each round, dashing once, then on the next turn ordering their Beast to dash, and then on the next turn dashing themselves, and then on the next turn ordering their Beast to dash, so on and so forth, which would likely result in one or the other, or both, of them being caught, squashed, etc. So what if instead of the common interpretation, we look at the fact that that's not supported by the text, and instead use common sense? So on round one, the ranger uses their action to order their beast to dash, and moves forward, the beast dashes. And then on subsequent rounds, the beast simply defaults to what their ranger master told them to do with round one, dash. So round two, the ranger dashes and the beast dashes. Round three, the ranger dashes, the beast dashes. Round four, the ranger dashes, the beast dashes. This makes much more logical sense than the common interpretation. Let's step now partway back to combat with the help action. But first, recall the following from the player's handbook. Holding his hand high, a half-elf whistles to the hawk that circles high above him, calling the bird back to his side. Whispering instructions in Elvish, he points to the owlbear he's been tracking, and sends the hawk to distract the creature, while he readies his bow. Now, following the conventional interpretation that the ranger has to use their action every round to tell the beast what to do, Round 1. The ranger uses their action to tell the beast to take the help action. Cannot attack, but they can cast Hunter's Mark. But someone else gets to attack with advantage, because the beast still takes the help action if they're in position. Now round 2. The ranger would again have to use their action to tell the beast to take the help action, but cannot attack themselves because they used their, their action so someone else gains advantage from the beast's help action. Round three, the ranger uses their action to tell the beast to take the help action and cannot then attack and gain the advantage. I hope you're seeing a pattern here. Now this makes no logical sense whatsoever. So let's ignore the common interpretation. Round one, the ranger uses their action to order the help action holds their beast back, and bonus action casts Hunter's Mark. Round two, the ranger verbally directs the beast where to go, no action required. 
The beast then takes the help action, since it moves and acts on the ranger's same initiative count. And now the ranger attacks with advantage, using their action. Round 3. The beast is in position, uses the help action, the ranger attacks with advantage. Rinse and repeat. This makes logical sense and follows the text as written. DMs, yes, this does mean that the Beastmaster can get three attacks on their turn, or sometimes more, and move and control their beast all at once, which makes it markedly different from things like Find Familiar, or Conjure Animals, or the mount spell that the Paladin gets. Because all those other creatures that are conjured through magic roll their own initiative. The Beast Master and the Beast Companion don't. They go on the same turn. This will sometimes be more complicated. And as such, I generally recommend that players who are new to the game get a little bit more familiar with the action economy, movement, and bonus action economy before they start experimenting with having two creatures to control at the same time. Having said that, I have tried this in solo games and with one of my other players. The alternative method works. It's streamlined with the combat. It's a lot of fun. It is challenging. And so sometimes maneuvers still are a little clunky. So I encourage DMs to experiment with it. Try it out for yourself and see just how it works in combat and other features of gameplay like the help action or the dash action or the dodge action or the disengage action. If you're worried about this destabilizing combat, then caveat it for your players by stating that you are trying a new method to see how well it works. And if it doesn't work for your table, then don't use it. And players, remember, you're at your DM's table. Their interpretation of the rules is what matters. So, how did the fighter and ranger do at second level, compared to each other and to the baseline? Thus far, I have built my ranger along the most traditional, common lines possible. High dexterity, archery fighting style, and now hunter's mark. Now, according to conventional wisdom. This combination is the only way for a ranger to get comparable damage to other martial classes, or basically to just get too even with other martial classes. The fighter has had archery fighting style since level 1, and has just gained their, deservedly, vaunted action surge. At second level, the baseline average damage per hit is 7.65. The fighter made 16 attacks, 9 of which hit, for a total of 69 points of damage, which is an average damage per hit of 7.67, just marginally better than the baseline. They also used Action Surge twice to attack, contributing 11 points to the overall damage of 69, or 16% of the fighter's total damage. The ranger made 15 attacks, 12 of which hit, for a total of 140 points of damage, which is an average damage per hit of 11.67, outdoing both the baseline and the fighter. Now, if conventional wisdom is to be believed, I would expect that Hunter's Mark, which the Ranger used three times, would account for anywhere from 50% to 75% of the Ranger's total damage, as it's supposed to be the only thing which makes the Ranger comparable. Hunter's Mark contributed a total of 46 points out of the 140, or just 33% of the Ranger's overall damage at level 2. If Hunter's Mark had not been used, the Ranger would have done a total of 94 damage, or 7.83 average damage per hit. In other words, at least at this level, Hunter's Mark was superfluous. 
this does not devalue the spell, but it does seem to indicate that, while certainly useful, Hunter's Mark is not necessary to the ranger for damage. I hope you're finding this interesting, and I hope that you'll join me for more exploration into the ranger class. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.